Good morning, church. It is good to be with you today. Hello, hello. My name is Pastor Waylon Heimer. If you don't know, I'm the youth pastor here. And Pastor Jason and Monica have given me the wonderful and great honor of being able to speak to you guys today. So I am very excited about what we have to go through today. I just want to wanna thank Pastor Jason and Monica for this opportunity and really thank all of you guys and everyone for just being the church that you are. Me and Mallory have been here for two and a half, almost three years, and we have just been so blessed to be a part of a community like you guys. So you guys do an awesome job. I just want to say thank you so much. So, Pastor Jason has been bringing us through the kind of the book of John a little bit, and he's taken us through the first couple chapters, and so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of continue the journey a little bit, and we are going to be in John chapter 3. So if you want to pull out your Bible, pull out your notebooks, we are going to go and be in John chapter 3. I am very excited about the message today. The first half of this message is really going to be about um, exegesis. What does the verses mean, their context, and what was trying to be said through them. And then after that, I'm going to go through application. and Hopefully, I'll be able to give you guys some uh, lesson or a challenge that you'll be able to go through and take with you in the week ahead. Amen? Amen. Okay, so uh, I come a little bit from the south, so I like it when the audience responds a little bit. So, like, you can, you can say something back to me. It won't scare me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, there we go. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for this message. I just pray that you would be here, that uh, the words said from the pulpit from up here would not be my words or my opinions, but they would be yours to the church, to the people here and online today. Lord, I just pray that you would bless it and bless the message in Jesus' name. And everyone said? I know you guys are getting better at this. So we are going to be in John chapter 3, and we're just going to start right up there. We're going to be in verse chapter 1. You can read along the screen with me or in your Bible. Here we go. <clears throat> now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So let me give you some context of what's going on in this passage. And a lot of it revolves around Nicodemus. So Nicodemus, as the pa passage says, was he was a member of the Jewish ruling council. The name of that council was called the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin, they were a, a, an elect group of Pharisees that would come together. They would resolve disputes. They would make this important decisions and everything like that. You'll see the Sanhedrin come into play later in the Bible uh, with Paul and his journeys and some other of the, uh, the disciples they kind of get involved with them too. But so the Sanhedrin was an important group of people. So Nicodemus wasn't just a regular Pharisee. He wasn't just a regular teacher. He was a very well-respected one. He had, uh, a, uh, he had a significant amount of clout. And so Nicodemus goes to Jesus at night. And the reason why he does this is because he doesn't want anyone seeing him going. He doesn't want any drama or sayers to be like, Isn't, is Nicodemus jo joining the side of Jesus? Is, is he with this? Uh, fake teacher because some of the Pharisees were looking at Jesus and the fact that he was doing all these miracles and everything and they were like this can't be of God because he's not teaching what exactly what we're teaching and so it has to be of the devil and Nicodemus realizes you know Jesus actually like wouldn't be able to do these things without the spirit of God so God has to be on this guy Nicodemus sees that but he doesn't want people thinking uh, that he's like going to be a disciple and so he goes at night to avoid drama and any type of uh, conflict that might arise of him being associated with Jesus. And that's a whole sermon in itself right there, but we're going to keep going because we have something else to say today. There's a lot in this story, by the way. There's like so much theology in these like first 20 verses of John 3. I could do a whole series in just these couple of verses, but we're going we're gonna to hit something really important here. So Nicodemus was one of the Sanhedrin, very well-respected teacher, came at night because he didn't want to be seen. Um, so he recognizes Jesus, he even says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a man of God. So he recognizes Jesus as a teacher. He recognizes that and he tells that to Jesus. And Jesus 
being Jesus and God and all that just cuts to the heart of the issue and takes the rug out underneath from Nicodemus' feet. And he tells Nicodemus, very truly, I tell to you that no one can go to heaven unless they are born again. And you can see Nicodemus' reaction here. He misses it, like just completely goes over his head. I can imagine Nicodemus is just like, okay, like, um, like I, I don't get this. Like, do I, I have to crawl back in my mom? Do, do I have my clothes on during the process? Like, like how does this work? And he's just, he's so confused and shocked. And you know, Nicodemus was also probably expecting some type of uh, reward or something for his work because he was not just your ordinary teacher. He had been doing this for his entire life. He had been very well practiced. He's very, very, very learned. He like it, he lived and breathed the Torah. And so you can imagine Nicodemus was expecting some kind of reward or he was expecting to not only just kind of like make it into heaven, but maybe make it into heaven with a little extra reward because, you know, he did what he was supposed to do and he, he was a good Christian and everything like that. And so when Jesus tells him that no one of any, of any, no one of any nationality, of any religious affiliation is going to be able to enter the heaven unless they're born again. We'll get to the word born again there because it's very important. And so Nicodemus is super shocked by this and, and he just kind of misses it. And we learn something about Nicodemus's reaction or from Nicodemus's reaction. We learn something about Nicodemus. As learned and as practiced as Nicodemus was, he was not very spiritually aware. And so he missed this whole thing that Jesus was talking about, this about being spiritually aware. And it's kind of why Jesus kind of goes into this whole flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to spirit. He goes into a very, Jesus gives a very, very, very good picture of the Holy Spirit and, and uh, comparing it to wind and how we see the effect of the Holy Spirit, but we can't see it and we don't know where it came from or where it's going or what it's doing. And it's very good. I don't have time to go into all this stuff. I really wish I could just stand up here and give a four hour sermon because there's just so much here, but we'll move on. We're going we're gonna to keep going. We're going to look at a very specific word, the word born again. I feel like we use this word a lot in Christian circles, and sometimes it kind of loses uh, what, it, what its real meaning is and what it's supposed to mean, and, and it's, it's a weird word. It's a weird phrase. If, if you're not a Christian and I go up to you, I'm like, hey, you need to be born again. You're going to be like, what the heck are you talking about? You're going to be very confused if you're not familiar with the Christian faith at all. It's a very weird word. And so whenever there's a word that I'm like, I want to know more about the word or I want to, uh, I'm very confused about what it means or why that word is there. And I'm just like, okay, well, what, is, what am I supposed to do with this? I always go back to the original language. So if you don't know, the Bible is written in two languages. Languages. The first half, the Old Testament, is written in Hebrew, and the second half is written in Greek. And so we're reading John in the New Testament. It's in Greek. And I took two years of Greek in college, so I can kind of understand it. But luckily for you guys, you don't have to take Greek in college because there's a handy-dandy tool on the internet called the Blue Letter Bible. You want to write that down if you're taking notes. It's called the Blue Letter Bible. You can go there. You can search phrases, verses, and it gives you the original language and has a lexicon goes it, it defines it, it parses it. The whole deal does all the heavy lifting for you and you just get to get some good treasure out of the word of God. And that's what I did for today's sermon. So we're going to look at the word born again. If you want to put that slide up there. Now my, my PowerPoint thing messed up my, my words and it moved the last letter of each word to the bottom there. So that W looking thing, which is technically an O, goes on the end of the first word in the N, or which is the V looking thing, goes on the end of the second word. And so the word is pronounced like this. And my pronunciation isn't the best, so just bear with me. But the, the pronunciation goes like this. Genoa, Anothen. Say the first word with me. Say Genoa, Anothen. Oh, did I say that right? Ganawa. Gen, Ganawa, yeah. So Ganawa means to be born, to be fathered. It, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's one to be born or have, having, having been born. It's, it's pretty much self-explanatory. The next word, anothen, is the cool word. It's the word that gives us the fun little truth, a little golden nugget that I found. So anothen can be uh, defined and is most commonly defined as again. But there's some different ways that you can 
define onothin, and I think this is super cool. Another way that you can define onothin is anew. And that's pretty cool. That's to be born anew. That's, you're like, yeah, I can get that. I can get behind that. The th another, there's a third way to uh, translate onothin, and this was the moment when I saw it, and I was just like, oh! I'm like, that's so cool. I saw it. A way that you can translate onothin is from above. So some of you are already kind of putting the pieces together in your mind. Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born from above. And Nicodemus misses that. From above means what? Well, obviously, it means from heaven, from above. And so Jesus says, you must be born from above. Your spirit must be reborn, is essentially what Jesus says. So he's talking to Nicodemus, and he says, your spirit must be reborn. Because you think about it, we are all born physically. We're given birth into this world. But we are born with a corrupted spirit to begin with, a spirit inclined toward evil. That's just the way we are. Every human gets that spirit. And so we get this evil spirit, and Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He's like, no one is going to get to heaven unless their spirit is reborn. And I love the way one of my commentaries put this. I was doing some research, and one of my commentaries put it this way, and I just think this is one of the best ways I've ever, ever, ever heard this. So the Tyndale commentary says this. To be born again and to be willing to receive ungrudgingly the gifts God offers involves the abandonment of every attempt to become righteous by anything a man may do by himself and the willing acceptance of the free gift of grace. Such a complete reorientation is an experience that can be well likened to physical birth, for it is an emergence from darkness and to light when the restricted and confined are at last set free. You could just sit on that and meditate on that little section there for a long time. But I want to go back to one of the phrases that stuck out to me. The to be born again involves the abandonment of every attempt to become righteous by anything a man may do for himself. Sometimes I feel like we work so hard to either make it worth our renewal, our spirit renewal, our salvation. We try to work for it, or we even try to make it the work worth it. And the, it doesn't just simply involve the acceptance of it, but involves the abandonment of trying to become righteous by yourself. I think that's very powerful. And you can go and you can think on that your own some more, because I got some more meat here that we got to go through. You can meditate that on your own. So this is a really powerful, powerful concept of being born again, about your spirit being renewed, about your spirit being rebirthed. In fact, it reminds me of my own salvation story. I felt like I should share this today because uh, I realized not a lot of people, even though I've been here for a couple of years, some people don't know uh, my salvation story or my story really. So I feel like it's something that I should really just tell you guys. So my dad is a pastor. He was a pastor when I was born. He still is a pastor. My dad's my hero. I love my dad. So I grew up in the church. I was born into the church. I was born going to Sunday services. I was at church more often than I was at school. And, it, and it's not an exaggeration either. So I was like, I was at church all the time. I grew up in the church thing. And because of this, I had a very different experience than a lot of people when it comes to my salvation and my faith walk. I uh, like most people have this thing where it's like it's before God, God came into my life, and then the after God. And so this is the way I was living before. I wasn't following God. I was doing all these wrong things. God intervened, and now this is the way I'm living for God. I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to go in the right direction. I never had that. I grew up at the church, and I was following God pretty much from the moment that I was following God, is really the best way I can describe it. I said the sinner's prayer when I was five, but I already kind of understood it and was following that before I was five. And so, like, I went through this whole process of growing up in the church, and I wrestled with this whole, like, is it my parents' faith? Is it not my parents' faith? And I was, I never really, and well, I did wrestle with the fact that whether God is real or not and everything like that. But as I was kind of growing older, I never had that moment where my spirit got to be reborn because I was growing up in it and I believed it. I experienced the presence of God. I prayed to God. I went to camps. I went to 
retreats and I was called in the ministry. I prayed for people and they were healed. Like I, I was doing all the right things. I was living all the right ways. I knew God. He knew me. We talked. And, but I never had my spirit reborn. And so come in my senior year of high school, called into ministry, was going to college to be a pastor and everything like that. And I was really wrestling with this thing about like it just didn't feel real to me. Like I knew it, my head knew it. Like I had seen too much for me to not know that God was real. I have seen, I've experienced too much to, to be able to be like, he's, I, I couldn't say he's not real. And so I, like, I knew, but like, it, I couldn't feel it in my heart that it was real. And I remember the way my house was built up is I was in the, uh, living in the basement or the dungeon at that time, and I had my own little restroom thing. And so I was in there, and I was really wrestling, and I was like praying with this, and I was wrestling with God, and I was talking to him. I'm like, God, I need this to be real. Like, if I'm gonna go where you want me to go, and I'm gonna dedicate essentially the rest of of my life to you. This has to be real. This has to be something true in my spirit. And I was wrestling with this, and I asked God, I'm like, Lord, make this real. And I remember it was kind of like a light switch flipped on, and it just was real. And my spirit kind of accepted it. And it was a newness, and it was a freshness in my spirit. And I was able to go forward and move in that. See, I was very much like Nicodemus. Nicodemus was learned. He was practiced. He was following the, wall, the rules. He made it up the hierarchy of the, the, the religious sect at the time. So like he, he had it going. He knew what to do. But Nicodemus was not spiritually aware. And his spirit was not rebirthed from above. And that's such an important thing. And I feel like some of us here today are like that. In fact, watching online and us, those present here today, I actually feel like there are three people here, three types of people that are here today. The first one is that you have never experienced God. You don't know God. Maybe this is your first time in church. You haven't had his presence come into your life. You haven't accepted him. Listen, from someone who has walked this earth for a measly 25 years, and I have gone through the whole thing, like I've been on it, the track the whole time, I can tell you for certainty that God is real, that his love is real, and it's reaching out for you. Your life, it's not, it's not a golden ticket into heaven. It's the best life you could possibly live, live now plus heaven. And it is so great. And it's so powerful. And I want you to experience that. And God is just waiting for you to freely accept that gift. You don't need to change yourself. You don't need to start doing a bunch of different things with your life to accept that gift, to accept God's grace. It is real. It's powerful. And I want you to give it a chance today. So in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. The second type of person today is this, is very much like Nicodemus, like I was when I was in high school. And uh, you have maybe grown up in the church and you kind of have done the things, you've done the motions, you know when to raise your hand during the song, you know when to say amen during the sermon. Amen. There, someone got it. <laughs> and so, and you, you know how to do it. And, but it's never become real. Your spirit has never been reborn. Or, Maybe you've had that moment, that salvation moment, where you, got, you came to God, your spirit was reborn, and you've done it decades and decades ago, and now you've gone through the motions, you've been doing it for a while, you've gone to church religiously every Sunday, and you're going and you're going and you're going, and it stopped becoming special. It stopped becoming important, and you need your spirit to re be reborn the other translation of anothen, anew. Maybe you need to be born anew. So whether you are here and you've grown up in the church and it's just your head and it's not real yet, your spirit hasn't been born anew, or maybe you've done the church thing, you had the salvation moment, but it's become so cut and dry in the same thing every single day that you've kind of drifted away or maybe you've lost it a little bit and you need your spirit to be born anew. I'm going to give you an invitation in a moment to take that extra step. And lastly, the 
third type of person that is here today is someone who's done it. You've had the spirit being born anew. You're walking in it. You've got it, and it's, it's good. I have a challenge for you, and it's simple to understand, but without the grace of God, it's impossible to do. It's the simple fact of letting your outer being be a reflection of your inner being. Your words, your actions, your reactions should be a reflection of the power and love of Christ that has happened on your inside. Your goings and your doings throughout your week on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday should point to God. Every single one of them should. And see, that's the hard part. And that's why I say it's impossible, because it is. Without the grace of God, without the strength of Christ, you will not be able to measure up to that standard. We're not built in the way to be a perfect reflection every single time. We're not born that way. And so that's why Jesus in the Bible actually talks about my yoke is easy, my burden is light. For those of you that actually don't know exactly what that means, when Jesus said that to the Jewish kind of lay people and everything during that time, they were like, oh yeah, that makes sense. How many of you here plow your fields with ox, oxen? How many here? No one. So you don't know what it means. So what happens is when they would bring a new bull, fresh, hasn't plowed the field before, and he's trying to learn how to do the job, they yoke him. If you don't know what a yoke is, it kind of looks like those prison stall things, but just like the top half of it, and it goes over the neck of both of the oxen. And so what happens is they would put the veteran bull on one side, and they would put the new, fresh, day one buck oxen dude on the, right, on the other side, and the veteran would take the brunt of the burden, take the brunt of the force, and do most of the work, because he knew how to do it and he knew how to do it right and so he would go and so the other ox all he had to do was follow and learn and that's what God says to you is you just need to follow and learn so without being yoked to Christ which involves a continual connection with him being connected with him in spirit praying with him talking to him having him pour into your life without that without being yoked to Christ you have to learn and you have to do the whole thing all on your own and we're not built for that so for the type of the third person My challenge for you is to be yoked with Christ and let your outer being be a reflection of your inner being. If I can have the worship band come on up here. In a moment, we're going to give each type of person here, both online and in person, we are going to give you an opportunity. We're going to give you an invitation. And I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to kind of pray with you a little bit. But I encourage you, if you feel like you're that person, if that type is, applies to you, you might feel a little tightness in your chest or in your stomach. And that might be the Holy Spirit. That might be God poking you and being like, this one's for you. This, this one's for you. If that's you... I encourage you to pray to yourself and pray. You can pray quietly under your breath. You can pray in your mind. You can pray out loud if you want to. But I encourage you to pray with me in that moment. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's pray. Everyone bow your heads, close your eyes. Lord God, I just pray right now, we invite you into this room. We invite your presence in this place right now, Lord Jesus. We pray that your presence would be on each and every person, both watching online and sitting here right now. I pray for the first type of person, those that have not ever given their life to Christ, not have never known God. Lord, I pray right now that your hand would be on them. They would feel your presence. They would feel your love in such a real and such a powerful way right now, Lord Jesus, in such an undeniable way that they cannot say it is anything but you, Lord. I pray as they begin to pray and ask for forgiveness of the times that they've missed the mark and pray for the time for you to be able to come in to be the Lord of their life, that they would confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that you died and rose again, Lord. I pray for these people that you would be with them, that you would guide them, that your presence would be on them and they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love them in such a real and such a passionate way right now, Lord Jesus. I pray that your presence would be on them they would right now begin to feel you filling up their heart and be able to fill the joy and the happiness inside them, Lord. I pray right now that your blessing would be on them and that they would begin to accept you into their life. Lord, I pray for the second type of person. 
If that's you, go ahead and pray with me now. Lord, I just pray right now that you would just be with them, that they would take this moment and they would ask you to be real, to be new, that you would breathe a newness into their spirit, that their spirit has never been fully reborn, that you would rebirth it now, that they would be able to feel a freshness in their spirit. Maybe they've walked away, maybe they've drifted away and it's church has just become motions to them, just become things to do. Lord, I pray that you would breathe a spirit into them where it would be power and it would be powerful and it would go and it would seep into every every single aspect of their life right now, Lord. I just pray for them that your presence would be on them, that they would begin to feel a presence of your spirit, of newness and of power on their life right now, Lord Jesus. I pray for the second type. Lord, I also pray for the third type of person here. I pray right now that this is the difficult task. This is the hard one. That as we walk out of these doors, that we would walk into our workplaces and our homes and our daily life, Lord. That you would allow us to be able to be a reflection of your love. A true and pure picture of how much you love humanity. And how much you have died and given up so that they could come to you. Lord, I pray right now that you would give them the strength. That you would allow them to be yoked with you. That if they haven't been yoked and fully attached to you, that you would attach and you would yoke yourself with them right now, Lord, that they begin, would begin to walk with you, that they would be able to be able to pray with you daily, that the word of God would become alive to them and they would read that daily, Lord. I pray that you would yoke yourself with them and they would be able to walk and be able to be such a shining, bright city on a hill that the people in their life would look at them and say, there has to be something different. Lord, I pray right now that you would be with them. I pray that your presence would be on them. And as they go out and as they come back in, that your fire and your power would shine brightly to the people that need to see it the most. Lord, I pray that you would bless these people. I pray you would bless both everyone that watched online and everyone that was here, Lord. I pray that you would touch them, you would protect them, and you go with them as they go out, as they come back in. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Hey, if you gave your life to Christ for the first time, can we give them a round of applause? If you gave your life to Christ for the first time, heaven is celebrating with you. They are throwing a party. They are going all out for you guys. And we want to celebrate with you too. We have a special Bible for you and we have a special pamphlet for you at the coffee counter. If you want to go grab that, we would love to connect with you. If you're online and you gave your life to Christ for the first time, please message with us. Reach out to us. We want to connect with you and we want to celebrate you together. Amen? Amen. Amen. You guys have a great Sunday. Thank you, Pastor Whelan.